I'm not saying that we should all give up the life support science and technology that our rationalist way of doing things has given us and come here to the foot of Everest, reject the world, and meditate. Just that non-scientific views of the world, like this, aren't necessarily ignorant. In their own way, they explain the universe as completely as science does. And as you've seen from this series, all that science gives us is what their belief gives them. Certainty. Only ours changes all the time. Theirs doesn't. As for the permanent values that are supposed to remain unchanged in spite of our changing knowledge, well, they change too. Once it was good to burn women, wrong to claim the earth went round the sun, logical to argue about angels on the head of a pin. The values change every time the universe changes, and that's every time we redefine a big enough bit of it, which we do all the time through the process of discovery that isn't discovery, just the invention of another version of how things are. And yet, in spite of that, we still go on believing that today's version of things is the only right one. Because, as you've learned from this series, we can only handle one way of seeing things at a time. We've never had systems that would let us do more than that. So we've always had to have conformity with the current view. Disagree with the church, and you were punished as a heretic. With the political system, as a revolutionary. With the scientific establishment, as a charlatan. With the educational system, as a failure. If you didn't fit the mold, you were rejected. But, ironically, the latest product of that way of doing things is a new instrument, a new system that while it could make conformity more rigid, more totalitarian than ever before in history, could also blow everything wide open. Because with it, we could operate on the basis that values and standards and ethics and facts and truth all depend on what your view of the world is. And that there may be as many views of that as there are people. And with this capable of keeping a tally on those millions of opinions voiced electronically, we might be able to lift the limitations of conforming to any centralized representational form of government originally invented because there was no way for everybody's voice to be heard. You might be able to give everybody unhindered, untested access to knowledge, because a computer would do the day-to-day -day work for which we once qualified the select few in an educational system originally designed for a world where only the few could be taught. You might end the regimentation of people living and working in vast, unmanageable cities, uniting them instead in an electronic community where the Himalayas and Manhattan were only a split second apart. You might, with that and much more, break the mold that has held us back since the beginning in a future world that we would describe as balanced anarchy and they will describe as an open society, tolerant of every view, aware that there is no single privileged way of doing things. Above all, able to do away with the greatest tragedy of our era, the centuries-old waste of human talent that we couldn't or wouldn't use. Utopia? Why? If, as I've said all along, the universe is, at any time, what you say it is, then say.
Okay, I, I understand the general point. To put it like a professor, science too is a culture-based activity. But what is the point of the Buddhist sequence near the end? That, that we should remain more open, pluralistic, less insistent on conformity? Yes, it's part of that trap I talked about in Program 1. Uh, the trap set in Program 1 was to in intimate that, you know, the Buddhist didn't ask questions and they were dumb and stupid and in fact what I'm trying to do is to say having been through the experience of the series you recognize that that people are constrained by the context in which they live to believe that what they believe is true and final the only real answer ever found and when you when you take that and look at you say science is like that and then you look at other belief systems the Buddhists in their way explain the universe entirely satisfactorily for the people who believe in them as does science for us so that's the, yes. In other words, it was a plea for more open-mindedness on our part. Well, uh, Western science, I understand that our values affect how we interpret phenomena we observe, yes. but, but isn't it true that Western science is in some sense incremental? Uh, how drastic are these revolutions that change the universe? I think, first of all, that it's incremental, that it grows and grows and grows. It's a kind of rewrite of history that quite often you find in scientific books about their own activities. You know, people in the past were always aiming towards us. Anyway, if you look at most of the major theories, they were blown away. Uh, Copernicus. Before Copernicus, the sun went round the earth. After Copernicus, the earth went round the sun. I mean, how different can you get? That's not one thing building on another. It's one thing destroying another. And I think, except for technology, you know, building tables and chairs and bits and pieces, apart from that, uh, what's happened has not been a steady accumulation, a steady move towards the final truth. No. You use the space shuttle uh, as an image of scientific achievement. Um, uh, in many minds, uh, since that material was shot, the space shuttle, like uh, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, mm. uh, has become a symbol of a kind of overreaching of scientific hubris. Yes. Um, you hold out great hopes for the computer. Um, but isn't it possible that that too is in some sense a naive expectation, that it can can revolutionize human society, yes. reduce human waste? There, there, there is one, it seems to me, one major difference and that is that the computer is already in the hands of people. Uh, once upon a time, 20 years ago, people said, the computer will, will all be controlled by the computer because there'll be this massive mainframe brain somewhere. It'll run the world, you know, and look, everybody has one. Everybody has something. Soon there will be people selling them information, knowledge, experience on disks uh, because the marketplace works like that. It's too late for uh, society to be in the grip of the monster machine anymore ever since... Uh, the days of the personal computer began. So that's why I am optimistic about the effect of the computer on our society, because it, for the first time ever, those massive tools of science are actually in the hands of ordinary people to a great extent, in a way that makes it very difficult to control them. You can't, what are you going to do with all these people modem talking to each other? You can't come into the telephone lines and, and, and no. control. But not too late in a place like the Soviet Union, where no. government control is a reality. And to go back to program number one, the NORAD sequence, uh, Rome was overrun by barbarians. What's to keep that from happening to us? I be believe the awareness of uh, the fact that other systems uh, are neither right uh, nor wrong. They are what they are. I mean, if we are to live, we, it seems to me we must coexist. Uh, that's why NORAD was an irony at the beginning of the series. Uh, to be so certain that you will destroy seems to me to be, to be taking the wrongest possible road. Uh, and that's why this series has built, I hope, gradually towards an understanding that the only way to continue to exist safely is to be tolerant, as tolerant as possible. You have a new educational model in mind. Teach people to go looking for the material uh, and they'll discover that there are many different ways of seeing how the world operates and that in turn I think will feed back into creating a safer world for everybody. Sounds like your next series. Hope so. <laughs>